If you haven't purchased one already, a power meter may be something you're very keen to invest in. But what are the benefits? And if you own one already, do you even know why? Or do you just own one because you think you should own one? Whatever your reasons, here are a few key tips you should know for making the leap into the world of watts. First things first, why do you actually need a power meter in the first place? It's not just so you can brag to your teammates that you own one, because they're an extremely useful measurement for analysing your training, and far more accurate than other measures such as average speed. Power meters take into account the actual physical effort you're putting through each pedal stroke, which is a far more accurate reading for your training ride compared to average speed, which can be affected by the terrain or the weather conditions. Secondly, you can pace your effort to perfection. The chances are at the beginning of a race, you have adrenaline pumping around your body, therefore making the effort that you're riding at probably unsustainable, even if it doesn't feel like it at the start. Knowing when you need to rest can be tricky based on personal feeling alone, and partly because when you start to feel run down, it's probably too late. Training with power does give you strong indications of when you need to rest, but also when your form is about to peak. This real-time feedback is crucial, as there is no drift which can occur with heart rate monitors. An attack on a climb may only result in a spike in heart rate, but at that point it could be too late and you've already gone into the red. As previously mentioned, using average speeds or times on courses and certain segments can give a rough idea to track your fitness progression. However, utilizing FTP results over time can result in a far more precise and accurate measure. We won't go too in depth here, as we have a power meters buyer's guide video already, which will tell you all about each type of power meter but the three types come from the pedals, the hub, and the crank, all of which have positives and negatives that will work best for you, your riding, and your budget. So you're back from your ride, and what's the first thing that we all do? Upload our data, of course. However, when you're training and racing with power, the world of data is opened up to you with a plethora of numbers. But here's a quick breakdown of what each one means. Training Stress Score, or TSS. This is the number that relates to the intensity of a single training session. The higher the number, the more strenuous it has been. Acute Training Load, or ATL. This is the short-term fatigue number that is accumulated and estimated over a seven-day period. Chronic Training Load, or CTL, is the longer-term fitness accumulation rating based over a 42-day period of time, with rides that are completed more recently weighted higher towards this number. Training Stress Balance, or TSB, is the number that's the difference between CTL and ATL and addresses whether a rider may be approaching top form. When this number is positive, it indicates a good performance is approaching, following a decent block of training combined with low recent value of fatigue. This is where the tapering effect comes to fruition. So far, power meters may seem great. However, there are a few key mistakes that you need to know as it can trip up your training and make your training data completely useless. The first and most basic mistake is forgetting to zero offset a power meter before riding, and then you're relying on inaccurate data. Think of zero offsetting a power meter as the same when you reset a set of measuring scales. Air pressure, ambient temperatures, and other things can alter power meter readings in between rides. Therefore, zero in your power meter before each ride clears the residual torque and sets an accurate baseline to work from. Our second key data mistake to avoid is confusing simple average power with normalized power. Normalized power accounts for intervals and efforts that have occurred over the entirety of a ride, whereas average power will simply average out the training session as a whole, which can lead to misinterpretation of more intense sessions that may have actually been more fatiguing. Our third mistake is failing to acknowledge the differences between indoor and outdoor riding. The former involves zero coasting and no air resistance, whereas outdoors, there are many variables such as wind and drafting gains. So comparing the two can provide very different data results. So those are our key points to help get you started training with data. And do let us know in the comments section what top tips that you have. And don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to the Cycling Weekly channel. But thank you again for watching. And until next time, we'll see you then.